Gee, I didn't know you were an aeronautical engineer. I'd like to cover these things, I learn things. I even learned that this morning there was a Project Norman. I'm a bit scared to discover what that was. So, a little while ago, I was living peacefully and comfortably in Palo Alto, uh, retired for the second time, and uh, enjoying myself, traveling around the world, doing far too many things on company boards and advisory boards, and the chancellor, the head of the University of California, San Diego, showed up at my home in Palo Alto and said, come back to UC San Diego. And I explained I didn't want a job. And he explained he wanted a new design program. And then he would give me two instructions that I had to follow. And the instructions were it had to be important and it had to be exciting. I could not turn that down. So I'm now at UC San Diego, just beginning, trying to set up a design lab. And I'll tell you about it. But one of the interesting things that happened is, it seems like almost the day we started, I suddenly get contacted by Sam and Yannicki, saying, uh, we want to come down and talk to you. And so they did come down and spend a nice day with us, walking on the beach and looking around the buildings. And, uh, so SAP actually became our very first sponsor, and so I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is not the first time I've been here. I mean, I actually interacted with SAP while I lived at, in Palo Alto. But yes, I would like to hope that we will do great things together. We started off with education. Uh, Scott Clemmer, who's a member of my group, has a very popular course on Coursera, and in fact he's building an entire human-centered design program in Coursera. And I have a not-so-popular course in Udacity. I only have some 60,000 people who have taken mine. He has some 300,000 who have taken his. Uh, but SAP was particularly interested in our helping them with these kinds of materials to develop material for the SAP developer community. Uh, when SAP first asked me, I said, you don't need us, because the people in this group do fantastic work. They do all the kinds of work that we are hoping we can train others to do. But there are 30,000 other developers all across the world who do SAP stuff who actually could use some help. So that's our first project. But that's not what we are about in San Diego. Design is changing. It's changing in a very interesting and powerful way. Design started off as a craft. It started off really in the 1800s uh, with Wedgwood China in, in England as mainly a way of producing reasonably nicely designed stuff for the, for the lower, lower and middle class English people who could afford it and it was attractive in their homes. And, and then over the years, design has become was primarily in products in the United States in the 1900s, it was kind of more in advertising uh, than anything else. And then, of course, as the devices became more complex, and especially with the advent of electronics and then computers, uh, design became confusing, or the products became confusing. And that was the beginning of the newest revolution in design, which is to, gee, let's think about the people and how they understand the products. And that's what eventually led to what we call today human-centered design, which is applied in almost every component of design, whether it's graphic design, interaction design, user experience, industrial design. Um, it's important for all components of design. But it's pretty well established. It's being taught in most of the major design schools of the world. Where do we go from here? A number of us have been talking about this for quite a while, as friends of mine from uh, a number of the major universities teaching design. And we happened to find ourselves in Shanghai at Tongji University, where we are the advisory board for Tongji. It has a new school of design and innovation. And we said it's about time we actually try to do something about where design is going. We decided we would call it Design X which is talking about complex problems. 
And that's what we want to do with San Diego. We want to take human-centered design thinking, we apply it to the complex social technical systems of the world. Because design is today is a funny thing. You're kind of trained that you're a designer and is a is a skilled craftsman. Uh, and it, you learn how to draw, you learn about materials, learn how to produce wonderful, beautiful products. But this is especially true for industrial design training. But when you go out, you may be asked to design a new health system or a transportation system. Or, you know, IDO is asked to help redesign the city of Singapore. So how do you do that with this traditional training and what kind of training is necessary? That's what we are trying to find out. So let's consider what it takes to redesign a system like, oh, healthcare. So one of the people we are working with, one of the groups, is the Radiation Oncology Group at UC San Diego. Now, the what treatment they give is pretty complex. They have a radiation machine that's made by Varian, a company just about half a mile from here. The machine is huge. It's, um, well, it's bigger than the stage. And it costs about $4 million. It has a linear accelerator built in. It has laser pointers all over the place. So when the patient lies down, there are big crosses uh, which say that's the target. Um, but when you put the patient on the machine, it can take up to 20 minutes to orient the machine and the patient so that the radiation is going in the right place, at the right angle, for the right duration, over the right area. But that's the easy part. The hard thing is, well, consider this case, uh, written for us by the people at the Radiation Oncology Center. So this is a false story, but every component is true. So they took real case stories and they put it together uh, into a fictional story to protect identities. But basically, assume that Julie is a six-year-old and has a problem with her leg. And, you know, she doesn't know if she should tell anybody about it. And eventually, what, a week or two later, she tells her mother. And her mother doesn't know how serious it is, so she waits a little while and finally takes her to the family physician. And the family physician doesn't know what it, what it is, so he says, well, let's get an x-ray. And they get an x-ray, which takes time because you have to schedule it, and then the radiologist has to read it, and the radiologist has to report back to the physician who has to report back to the family and says, you know, it looks suspicious, we should uh, get a biopsy. And so now you have to schedule that and put the, the six-year-old under general anesthesia and take a little sample, and then it has to be read uh, by the clinic and then report it back, and they say it looks cancerous. So that's scary, but now they have to go see a pediatric radio, uh, radio move. A pediatric radiation oncologist, okay? Which, uh, there aren't very many of them, so that takes time to schedule. So now it's about two and a half months after the pain. And they're still trying to understand what it is, and so now they order a CT scan and an X-ray and, um, and an MRI. And from that, they deduce, well, they begin to see what they have to do, but now they have to actually give, decide upon the treatment, and there's another specialist, in addition to the radiologist and the medical physicist, there's someone called a dosometrist, who has to decide exactly what kind of treatment to give. I can go on, but you didn't get the point. The point is that there are many, many different medical specialties involved. Each one has its own practice. Each one talks in their own language. Each one has its own scheduling difficulties. And this story keeps going, by the way. And the story keeps going to there are more than 25 different medical personnel, to say nothing of the support staffs uh, that were all being involved in about 12 different medical disciplines before finally the treatment is prescribed and then the radiologist uh, has to go off to a convention for a week and didn't want to delay any longer, so he decides to go ahead with the treatment. But it hadn't been reviewed by the Multidisciplinary Review Committee, which had its own scheduling problems. 
they came up to that committee, but no, they were they didn't get to her case. And the next week it came up again, but suddenly some urgent cases came in, so it didn't go to them, and so she got the treatment anyway. 25 days of treatment. After 10 days of treatment, the radiation committee, the multidisciplinary one, finally covers her case and says, but she didn't combine the CT scan with the MRI. And when you do that, you discover, oops, we were really radiating too much. So again, this is, uh, all these incidents have happened. Well, how do we solve that? So what is it, why is it that a design team thinks they can come in and solve it? What's special about design? I think we are special. And we're special because, in some sense, because we don't know anything. And not knowing anything is a real virtue. Because when you really know something well, then you assume that the way things are being done is the way it ought to be done. This is how it's always been done. And when you don't know something, but you come in with a designer's eye and you say, let me just watch for a while and try to understand. Let me make believe I'm the patient, or the mother, or the primary physician. So let me see it from those eyes and watch the whole case unfold. You begin to ask questions. And quite often you ask what are called stupid questions. What's a stupid question? It's one where everybody says, well, that's a stupid question. And then you say, well, why is it stupid? Because everybody knows the answer. Well, okay, why is that the answer? Usually, it turns out that nobody knows why that's the answer. It's just the way we've always done it. And so asking stupid questions is often the great insight that allows for major change. We are also not specialists in these fields. What we need to do to design, we need to understand the entire story from beginning to end and realize there are many different disciplines that have to work together. And because we aren't any one of those disciplines, we're in a better position to get them to work together. And when they start working together, they might realize that, oh, maybe there's a better way of doing this. So we are the catalyst that can cause great changes. First of all, we have a lot of insight about how to make things and do things. And second of all, we can bring the teams together. And third of all, we think by making. We think by drawing and by sketching and by doing prototypes and by doing tests. We don't claim to have the answer. We claim to be able to make things better, and better, and better, and better over the years. So that's why I think there's some real hope that we can tackle these really hard problems, sometimes called wicked problems. Problems so difficult that it's even difficult to define the problem. We don't have to solve the problems. Some of the problems have no solution, but we can make them better. That's what I'm hoping we can work on, and that's what I'm hoping we can work on at UC San Diego. Now, what are the other kinds of problems? Well, we're also looking with Nissan about um, automatic driving. So, yeah, cars that drive all by themselves, okay? I won't tell you how that's not going to happen for quite a while, because it's, it's an exponential. You know, you may think exponential the curves go like that, well, that's true, but that's with a positive exponent. With a negative exponent, an exponential goes like that, which means you make really rapid progress for the first bit, and then you're up to 95% to 98%, and it takes forever to get to 100%. And the hard part is that last remaining percentage, because that's where people come in. You know, the technology works fine, but learn for people. Of course, we're designing it for people. So, you ever try to cross the street, especially in Palo Alto, and you just look at the street and the car stops, so you wave it on, but the driver is courteous, so the driver waves you on, so you both go at the same time? Yeah. Or what happened to me and my wife? Um, I waved the driver on, uh, but my wife saw the car was stopped, so she walked across, right? Uh, was I trying to kill her? <laughs> or when you're at a street, uh, how do you know the driver has seen you? So now imagine this is an automated car. How do you know the automatically driven car has seen you? 
And what if there were two or three of you and the car signs a spotlight in your direction or something? How do you know it's for all three of you? Or what if you're driving your car and you come to an intersection and there's a car coming towards you? Now, you're supposed to be sitting there taking over in case anything goes wrong, and so you see that car coming towards you, and so obviously you want to slow up, right? And suddenly your car speeds up. What do you do? Now, it turns out that unknown to you, your car has talked to the other car by radio and said, okay, you slow down, I'll speed up, and that'll be just fine. But how do we tell that to the driver without overwhelming the driver with all the stuff they don't need to know? So this is, it sounds like a simple problem, and it's not those ones that the automated car people even think about. Except for Nissan, thank you. Um, actually, it's really interesting. Not only did Nissan ask us to work on it, but they told us we needed to do more ethnography. Now that's a great client. They even went and hired an anthropologist at Nissan uh, to work with us. And that's a great client, but that's rare. Now let's think about work. We are automating more and more things. What's gonna to happen to work? Now the problem is this. The people in artificial intelligence and the people in control theory and the engineers, they love to automate whatever they can automate and we just leave the rest to people. Which means that they leave the hard stuff to people. Which means they leave the stuff that we are particularly bad at to us. So what are we bad at? We're bad at sitting, doing nothing for hours, waiting for something to go wrong so we can take over in the next second. You know, in aviation, this happens all the time. The pilots have been flying for 10 hours on a flight and something goes wrong and it starts diving to earth and the pilots say, huh? Oh shit, what's happening? And it can take them a minute or two to figure it out. But the pilots are very well trained They've gone through many, many simulator experiments with almost all the accidents that we know about, and the airplane is five, six miles up in the air. It takes four or five minutes before it's gonna crash into the ground. So usually when these events happen, the pilots save the plane. In fact, it's rare that anything goes wrong. Now consider the automobile. According to the state of California, if you have an automated car, there must be a driver watching over, so if anything goes wrong, the driver can take over. Well, in one second, at 60 miles an hour, you've gone 90 feet. How long does it take to notice something's going wrong and knowing what you do about it? Far more than a second. It's just not going to happen. We're automating everything in the wrong way. We're automating what we can and leaving the rest to people. And so one thing that we hope to do is to change the way we think about this. What we want to do is say, look, these intelligent devices and machines can actually be of great assistance to us. But let's change the framework. Let's not think of it as automation to replace what people do. Let's think of it as collaborators. Let's devise the technology so that people using the technology do a better job and a more enjoyable job. Let the technology do the dull, dreary stuff. Actually, I think a calculator is a perfect example of this. A calculator doesn't work, doesn't do arithmetic the way I do, which is a good thing, because when I do arithmetic, I make mistakes. It does it differently. And doing arithmetic is no great skill. It's things that we memorize and do routinely. So why not let calculators do the arithmetic, or even for that matter, solve integral equations? Um, I don't think many of you have to solve integrals in your everyday life, but if you, if you ever took a calculus course, you spend a long time learning how to do it, but you know, it doesn't require great thinking skills. It's all look, changing the equation that you get so that it matches something that's in one of the handbooks so you can write down the answer. So let a machine do that. What we should be doing is thinking about what the, diff, what the problem is in the first place and then maybe how to express it so together with this other collaborator called a machine, we can do better. What's the best chess player in the world? Deep Blue. Deep Blue. Combination of Deep Blue and computers. It's not Deep Blue. It's a combination of people and computers. So there's a new kind of chess out today called freestyle chess in which instead of people against people or a person against a machine, it's you can do it any way you want. 
And so the best players are two or three good players with two or three good machines, and they can build, beat the world's best computer or the world's best individual. And these players are not the best players. Quite often they may be grandmasters, but not international grandmasters. And they're not the world's best chess players or one chess machines. They're the ones you can go out and buy. Uh, what they know how to do is work together as a team. And they know what questions they ask the chess machines. And it turns out one of the things they look for is when they take, say, three different chess playing machines and they give them the same problem and they come up with slightly different answers. Aha. Uh -huh. That's a, that's a point to explore fully. And by doing that, you actually, that's where you get the edge. Disc jockeys. A lot of the work has been automated. But we still need the disc jockey. Because what's been automated is the syncing up of the music. Because remember in the old days, it used to be they'd have to read the crowd and in their head decide what music to play and then go through all these, these records, old fashioned records, and choose the one or maybe you know, CD discs and choose the one and put it on the platter and then sync it up and then we, they learn the special tricks, scratching, going back and forth. But the real skill of the jockey, the real skill of the DJ is to look at the crowd and try to say, now's the time to change. Or we've got to speed things up or we need to slow it down or we need to change the tempo. And today they can do that and the machines do the little stuff. Was that a time warning? So, that was right on time. <laughs> what is the future of work? Is it going to be that we are going to be replaced more and more by machines? Or is it that we're going to have machines that act as collaborators and as we do our work in a distributed fashion, that is to say I'm working with people of the you know, the same table, the same bench, or I'm working with people on the other side of the world. Um, some of those people, some of those groups will be machines, and some will be people, and, uh, and it won't matter. Each of us will do whatever we're best at, and we'll combine to do a far better job and maybe a far more enjoyable job. So one of the things we really want to explore is how can we change the mindset away from just automate what you can automate to, let's do human technology teamwork. And that's one of the important directions for the future. Designers are powerful thinkers. We're really good at putting together a complex set of people and technologies and disciplines. We can do this for problems like medicine, education, transportation, economics, we can also do it for things like, how are we going to work in the future? And these are the important problems that we need to be working on. Thank you. <laughs>